sure we can. So good morning to, to all of you. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to present to you this new global conversation in, within the series of uh, Global Governance Online Lecture Series, Lessons and Challenges on Innovation Learned from the Israeli Experience on Do Our Food, Water, and Climate Need Global Governance. Uh, the, the, our speaker today is Ram Fishman, and let me just briefly introduce him, but first let me tell him how delighted we are that he has accepted to be our guest this morning and share with, him, with all of us his thoughts and consideration. Thank you, Ram, for being with us today. So Ram Fishman is an assistant professor of public policy at our partner institution, Tel Aviv University. Uh, prior to that, he was an assistant professor of economics at George Washington University. And even prior to that, he was a Giorgio Ruffolo, um, a postdoctoral fellow in sustainability science at the Harvard Kennedy School. I, I am delighted to learn that Giorgio Ruffolo, a great Italian, has uh, been entitled such a program. Maybe, Ram, you can tell us more at, the, at a, such a, an incredibly important institution like uh, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. You are an expert in sustainable development and uh, he holds a PhD in one of the most important interdisciplinary PhDs there are in the world from Columbia University in sustainable development. It was not there at the time when I was in New York, but it was created and it today carries a huge reputation worldwide. Uh, he has also a Master of Science in Physics from the Weizmann Institute and a Bachelor in Mathematics from Tel Aviv University. So a perfect guest for our interdisciplinary program. His research is focused on empirical and quantitative analysis of sustainable agriculture, water scarcity, and climate change with a, uh, with a strong emphasis on developing countries. He's the director of a research group at his university at TAU, uh, running multiple empirical field projects in Israel, South Asia, South Asia, I'm sorry, and Africa. And he's the director of the Nitsan Lab, which helps Israeli technologies in precision agriculture, water treatments to be technically and economically adapted to the requirements of uh, low-income people in developing countries. Ram, I hope I've said it all. And uh, without further ado, thank you so much for being with us. And I leave you the floor and in the hands of the 130 Global Governance students. Some students today are doing exams, but they wish they would have been here today with you. I leave you the floor. Thank you, Professor Piga. It's very nice to be here. Um, uh, I actually have a huge deadline this week, so forgive me in advance if uh, I didn't prepare a sufficiently good talk, but that's why I'm going to be relying on you. I didn't want to miss the chance to meet with you, um, so, but, but I'm going to be relying on you to make it uh, interactive and not just uh, a lecture so I can learn something too. And um, I also wanted to note that, I mean, it's a wonderful initiative. I, as Professor Piga mentioned, I have a little bit of an Italy connection, both through the program I was in at Harvard, which I, I can tell you a little bit about that if you'd like. Um, uh, and in addition, my sister actually studied in Italy and she speaks fluent Italian. So, so I have a little bit of a connection and I visited many times. Um, and actually one more element that I very much enjoyed was that I took part recently in a series of meetings at the Vatican um, that was organized by Jeff Sachs and the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in the Vatican around the issues of ethics for global issues. So it's a little bit connected and um, it just, I, like meeting you all brings back all these uh, Italian memories to my mind. So it's really nice to meet you. It's really wonderful to hear that you have such an interesting program going on. Um, I'd love to learn, you know, another time maybe we can talk about that also. I would love to learn about your experience in that. But today I just wanted to chat with you about food, water, and climate. Um, I understand from, I had a look at the program of, for the series of lectures and I, I noticed that you're going to be meeting a lot of scientists who are experts 
on, on various aspects, technological aspects of, the, of these challenges. Um, but I'm not like a scientist, a physical scientist, uh, more of a social scientist. So I want us to discuss today a little bit about the governance issues related to these challenges, um, what kind of governance we need for these resources, um, and also um, what, how we can, what, what tools do we have at our disposal to try to implement uh, those, those, those ideals. I'm going to talk at a very high level, very broad level initially, and then we can make it more and more specific and move from the bird's eye view down to the ground to the extent that you want. I spend a lot of the time on the ground, like thinking like, about these big ideas at the field level. So if you want to chat about that, I'd be very happy to. Um, but I thought we can start with a very like big picture perspective. And first of all, ask ourselves, really start with this very broad question. Do we need any kind of global governments for food, water, and climate? And in particular, what is actually the connection between, um, between food, water, and climate? Those are three big words. Um, so does anybody have any idea about the connection between food, water, and climate? Those three big global challenges we are facing. Anybody wants to suggest anything that connects the three? SDGs, okay. Um, Cor Cornelius, you can also speak if you want. Huh? Yeah, please speak. I would prefer uh, to hear you. Uh, Valeria, please uh, switch off the microphone, please. Okay, um, Cornelius, you can speak and introduce yourself. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cornelius. I'm a third year student in global governance from Germany. And um, uh, my comment about the, the connection between food, water and climate is um, basically that uh, the climate or these three points are basically interconnected through um, how water I think is distributed on the planet and um, now increasingly phenomenons of drought or um, floods, for example, that change the flow of water and actually that the whole water system on the whole planet is heavily interconnected that then influences again, of course, the agriculture in different countries and um, the supply of our nutrition. So the very fundamental things uh, for our survival, I would say. Absolutely right. So in fact, let me do something here and um, Draw an arrow. So you, you pointed out how the climate is affecting water, actually. Let me do it differently. So you pointed out how climate is affecting water, right? So if there is a drought, if there is a change in rainfall patterns, that's going to affect our water resources, right? Like, especially for us, in a place like Israel, we watch the rainfall very, very carefully because on a, on a year to year level, the amount of rainfall influences our entire water resources like Sea of Galilee, etc. The level fluctuates a lot from year to year and just one or two years of good or bad rainfall have dramatic consequences. So you're right, the climate definitely affects the water, our water resources around the world. And there is a concern that because climate, the cl changing rainfall patterns where rainfall falls, how much, when, that's all going to change the flow in rivers, it's going to change our groundwater resources, it's going to change everything about uh, our vital water resources. So that's absolutely true. So that's one link. Um, any other linkages be link between those three? Between food, water and climate. Climate affects water, very good point. Any other connection? So, right, um, the way we produce food affects the climate. Um, the, okay, great. Um, you guys are too shy to speak up. You prefer to write in chat? I guess so. So you're right. 
So the way we produce um, food, so first of all, it's very correct. The way we produce uh, um, food affects the climate. Um, specifically, how does, the, how does our agriculture affect the climate? Whoever said that, that the way you produce food affects the climate, what do you mean? Can you give an example? Why does, why does our agriculture affect the climate? Okay, you have them all now on video ready to speak. You have yeah. uh, Evelina, you have uh, Simone, you have Cornelius. Okay. Yeah, may I? Bye, Please. Simone. Hi, uh, I'm Simone from the second year uh, from Italy. Hi, Simone. Referring especially to uh, like meat production that is very much affecting in the climate and also agriculture in general. I don't know specifically, but in general, you know. Right. Why, why does meat production and why does agriculture physically affect the climate? Any idea? Uh, especially know. greenhouse gas emission. Yeah, where do these greenhouse gas emissions come from? Well, uh... you, you don't have to know it. I know that, uh, I know that uh, you know, it is not your field. So I'm just... just yeah, yeah, I'm not an expert, definitely. Yeah. But... <laughs> just in, happen, in case you happen to know only. I don't know specifically, again, I just... So, that's totally fine. What happens in agriculture, there are many ways in which agriculture affects, releases greenhouse gases. First of all, you know, the way we process the land releases carbon from land. Um, the fertilizer we produce depend on nitrogen. And so pr the production of nitrogen is energy intensive. So it uses a lot of energy. Um, it releases nitrogen um, gases into the atmosphere, which are also greenhouse gases. The reason meat consumption especially produces a lot of greenhouse gases, we just, a lot of our agriculture is for growing food for the animals we eat. Like very large areas that are used in the world for cultivation are not for our food, but for the food of the animals that we end up eating. So that increases very dramatically the scale of agriculture. If we didn't have, to, if we didn't produce any meat, we would need much less land around the world to feed ourselves, and therefore there would be less agriculture, and it would be, and there would be less emissions from it. And in addition, of course, there are some specific issues around gases produced by animals, methane from rice cultivation, and all in all, it adds up to a very large effect that the agriculture has on climate. In fact, and I'll show you in a minute maybe 20 or 25 percent of all the greenhouse gases are coming from agricultural related activities including deforestation cutting down forest for agriculture is a big part of that so almost a quarter of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the world are related to agriculture great so that's that's about how food affects the climate and then um uh, somebody else said food production depends on water uh, supplies and that's the same water availability affects our way of food production. Of course, we, water is crucial um, for, for food, right? So we can draw this arrow as well. Without, we need a lot of water to create uh, our food. Does anybody know how much of all the water in the world that we use is going for, to agriculture to irrigate crops? Any idea? I mean, we use water for many things. We use it for drinking, we use it for washing, we use it for industry. We also use it to grow crops. How much goes to growing crops? Any idea? Okay, I'll show you that in a minute. But the bottom line is that we, we saw how um, one, one more link is missing for me here, and that's this one, climate affecting food. So our agriculture is very sensitive to climatic conditions. When there is not enough rain, the yields fall. When the temperatures are high, the yields fall. And there are a lot of studies now looking at that question of how climatic variability and change is affecting agriculture and the effects are likely to be very, very severe, according to all the studies we have right now. 
So all of these are very, very strong linkages. And for this reason, the climate, water, and food cannot really be separated. So if we look at this from the perspective of, of, uh, of food production, we should keep in mind, let me get rid of these uh, annotation. So we should keep in mind that um, agriculture produces 26%, like I just said, of all the greenhouse gas emission. Land use for agriculture occupies already 50% of all the global habitable area on the planet. Agriculture takes 70% of, of the fresh water that we use in the world. It's responsible for also pollution of water. 80% of all global ocean and fresh water pollution is coming from agriculture. And we are not discussing biodiversity, but almost all the losses in biodiversity are caused by, in, to some extent, by, um, by agriculture. So if we think again about those three things, agriculture, water, and, and, and climate, they are very much connected. Um, and that goes back to the question. Right, exactly, Cornelius, exactly, that's, that's exactly the point. Um, and so that makes us want to ask, why is global governance relevant to this at all? Why can't these issues not be solved locally? Why is, what's, the, what's the relevance of global governance for dealing with this challenge? Any ideas? I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a, pro so redistribution is, is a, is a global concern. They are too interconnected to solve nationally or locally. Climate doesn't have boundaries. They are global issues, right? But um, what would be the more technical term you would use to describe, let's say, if we take the climate? The climate, what do we say, like in economics, that uh, that's all, these are all very good points. Um, but let's start with the climate. What, are you familiar with the language of private and public goods and all that? So why do we think of the climate as a, we think of the climate as a public good, right? Why, why is that? Please feel free to speak up. I'd love to hear your voices more. And don't worry about saying something wrong. It's no issue at all. Cornelius has raised his hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to raise your hand. You just jump in. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Thank well, you. I would uh, call it a public good because everyone should have uh, sort of equal access and equal usability of them. Like if there's a river or if there's a piece of forest, I mean, private entails that someone can, uh, can decide who gets to make use of that area, but public is sort of um, available equally to everyone. Right, so, so we, we, we often say as economists that a good is non-rival, meaning that if I enjoy the climate, it doesn't prevent you from enjoying the same climate, right? Or if I suffer from the climate, you suffer equally. Unlike something which is uh, a rival good is something like ice cream. If I eat the ice cream, then no ice cream is left for you. But the climate is not something that we consume. It's, if I enjoy a good climate, then everybody else can enjoy a good climate. And we also say that it's non-excludable. I cannot prevent, and technically it's not possible to put a fence around the climate, right? And to exclude it. So that makes it a pure public good. And, and that makes climate change a pure public bad, right? Meaning that, and the key element of that is that whoever produces, um, whoever produces greenhouse gas emission, those greenhouse, those greenhouse gases are going to change the climate, not just for whoever produced it, but for everybody in the world. In fact, the greenhouse gases mix up so much that it's really impossible to, to trace any climate change in any particular country to a source in any one other country. It's all a combined effect of all the emissions in every country in the world. 
So that makes climate really like the, the quintessential, the classic public good problem that in order to protect the climate or to avoid damaging the climate, we have to carry private costs, but the benefits are publicly distributed. And why is that a challenge? What, why is that a problem for us? This, this, this effect that, you know, whatever effort we make to preserve, whatever damage I cause to the climate is suffered by everybody in the world. Why, why does that make the climate problem more di very difficult to solve? No need to raise hand, you can just jump in. Maybe because we're 8 billion people and every individual has an effect, sort of. Absolutely, right. Maybe, maybe because we cannot have full control over everybody and everybody's action. Yes, exactly. And, and usually, that's exactly right. The, and the costs are private while the benefits aren't. So that makes it hard to cooperate, right? If we have a local pollution problem like air pollution in our city, it's the same issue. Um, it's exactly the same challenge. Every one of us drives their car and, and, and is responsible for some emissions and everybody in the city suffers from that. So that's also a public good problem, but that's exactly why we have governance. We have municipal governments, local governance to solve that, right? The city or the country, that government institution can pursue actions in the interest of the public good such as banning um, certain kinds of pollution behavior or incentivizing people not to pollute. That's exactly why we have government to solve this problem. But the, the climate operates at a scale which is global for which we don't have those institutions. That makes reaching the climate agreements internationally cl coordinated climate action, it makes it very challenging. And we are seeing it for 30 years now in the repeated attempts to reach a global agreement on climate. Um, maybe if we had a global government, action would have been taken long ago. Um, people in one, gov in one country say, why should we act first? You know, we are not the main polluter, others won't pollute. And, and so that, that probably plays a large role in the challenge that we are facing as a world in managing the climate. So good, so the climate is the classic um, is the classic uh, uh, environmental public good. However, food and water are much more localized phenomena, right? Water, you know, if I consume some water here uh, in Israel, then that doesn't really affect you in Italy. It affects maybe other people near the same uh, source of water, but it's not a source of water that you would be using anyway, so you are not directly affected by that. And similarly for food, you know, um, if I eat something or I produce something here, also it doesn't have as clear an effect um, on you in Italy. But because there is such a strong connection, like we just said, between the climate, water and food, indirectly that becomes an issue which may require some kind of global governance because first of all, the way I, I grow food here, not, not the actual consumption or growing, but the way I grow it, because it can affect the climate and it can affect other environmental problems, it actually can affect you in Italy. Not only with regard to how I grow it, but also the kind of food I consume. If I consume food from India, if I buy rice from India and the rice in India is produced um, in a very energy intensive way, for example, then that can affect you in Italy because of the emissions. But also my consumption of rice grown in India affects water resources in India. So that also creates linkages. There is one type of linkages happening through the climate connectedness, so that how we, the kind of agriculture we grow affects the climate everywhere. Um, and, the, and through trade, trade in food can, can transport the environmental impacts across countries. And we have this concept of virtual water. 
if I, um, but if I consume, if I import rice from India, rice is a very water intensive crop. Nobody grows rice in Israel. In fact, by the way, Israel is considered to be an agricultural superpower, right? It has this reputation of being a very advanced agricultural country. But how much of the calories that we consume in Israel do you think is grown in Israel? Any guess? Just guess. As an agricultural, very advanced country like Israel, how much of the calories that we Israelis eat is actually produced in Israel? Ten, good. Uh, it's actually around 10% or 20%. Uh, very good. Uh, you guys know your stuff. So it, it surprises a lot of people because they think Israel is such an agricultural superpower, but Israel is not even close to being food self-sufficient. And the same is true of many Middle Eastern countries. We just don't have enough water, and in the case of Israel, enough land to feed everybody. So what do we do? We don't grow cereals. We don't grow our calories. We import almost all our calories. We do grow high value crops, vegetables, fruits, which have a lot of economic value, but they do not have a lot of caloric value. So in terms of food security, we are a very food insecure country. We depend on the outside world for our calories. You cannot live on salad, right? You need, uh, you need grains. So, so that's related to the idea of trade in water. When I uh, eat rice, which was produced in India, in a way, I am consuming Indian water because in India, a lot of water has gone into producing that rice. So we don't trade in water. In physical water, we don't trade because it's very expensive to transport water. I mean, to some extent, we do uh, trade in like mineral water, bottled water, but that's a very tiny amount of water. The great amount, the most, like 80% of the water in the world is used for agriculture, not for drinking or any other purpose. Drinking is a tiny amount. So the trade in agriculture, in food around the world, creates a trade in virtual water. This is not physical water, but it's water which was used to grow whatever grains we transport. So whenever I import rice from India or from Italy, I'm basically moving water from these countries uh, to, to wherever I am. Okay, so those two elements, the physical connectedness and the market connectedness, create these global uh, challenges, make these food, water, and climate challenges really um, global. And if we have global uh, challenges, we have to think about how we should manage them. So what tools do we have to manage global problems? Any thoughts about that? Whenever we have um, global problems like the food, water, or any other problem, what kind of tools do we have as, po as political scientists, as economists, or whatever? What can institutions what, or, or governments or any other institution do to manage something globally? Any thoughts on that? Trade, excellent. Treaties, yeah, perfect. International agreements, trade, regulation and incentives. And one more thing. International cooperation, standards, right? The other thing I want to refer to, so in, when we think about our tools, we have markets, you said trade. Markets is, is an institution for uh, connecting uh, countries. International governance, even though we don't have a global government, we have international governance institutions like the United Nations, OECD, European Union, of course. So some of them are, you know, they're different spatial scales. Some of them are really global. And treaties is an example of that, very important. But another thing we can do which is somewhat of a global shared good is the production of knowledge or, or technology. So just engaging in R&D, in research and development, produces a public good, right? The most important and the most classic public good is knowledge. 
right? Because knowledge I produce is non-rival. And whether knowledge is excludable or not is like a, a, like a long running problem because to, to some extent, knowledge is excludable, right? That's why we have the whole system of patents, for example, to protect innovations from, other, from, from use by others who didn't contribute to it. So there have been many institutions that have been trying in, over time to protect knowledge through patents and other systems in order to encourage more innovation. The thinking is if there is no, if there is no way to protect the innovation, nobody will innovate. It won't pay. But that classic thinking about innovation and, and, the, and, the, um, and the exclusion of rights to use knowledge has really been challenged in, in recent decades, right? Like, what, any idea what I'm referring to? How has it been challenged? Any thoughts? Why, why is this idea of pro our ability to protect knowledge, why is it being challenged? In what ways has it been challenged in recent years, in recent decades? Let's, so, yeah. Right, so first of all, it's very easy to spread false information. That's true. But even if we think about innovation, like it's become much harder to exclude innovation from others, right? Um, and that's partly because, um, you know, if we think, for example, about movies and music, um, I'm sure that some of you download like uh, torrent for different movies without purchasing them properly, right? We all do it. A lot of the content has become, technically it's become easier to, to reproduce some kinds of creation. And uh, in fact, some, to some extent, the music industry has given up on attempts to uh, protect and has basically uh, moved to different models of, of creation and, and use of um, creativity. But even in technological innovations, you know, we hear a lot about the news, you know, often in the case of China, for example, how there is like all these industrial espionage. And when certain firms set up factories in other countries, those countries use that to try and learn about the technology behind it. So the globalization of economic activities has become a little more challenging for making R&D um, excludable. And why is that relevant for us? Because like somebody wrote here, um, uh, Evelina wrote, maybe sustainable development should be more available relating to R&D. And that's a very good question. If we are able to produce innovations that can help, for example, reduce climate effects of agriculture, and we exclude those innovations, maybe that's not optimal from a global perspective because maybe we want Maybe we want every farmer in the world to be able to grow their food with less greenhouse emissions because that can help us deal with, with the problem of climate change, right? If we have a marvelous new seed variety of rice that can grow with less water or can grow with less greenhouse gas emissions, wouldn't we want every farmer in the world to use it? We would because it produces good environmental benefits. And we all enjoy those. It can, the climate is a public good. So any knowledge which helps solve the climate problem is also a public good in this way. And maybe we should not try to exclude such technology. This suggests that maybe we should not leave such innovation to only private sector. Maybe governments should, should really invest a lot more in R&D for sustainable development and make that knowledge widely available maybe through international scientific cooperation to make those kinds of innovation available to everybody. If we develop cheap solar panels, if we develop ways of taking carbon out of the atmosphere, if we develop ways of conserving water, maybe those, that's the kind of, of know-how or technology that should be um, widely shared globally instead of being excluded. 
So in that way, R&D is a different, another tool we have for global governments in a way of the climate, food, and water. Does that make sense? So any questions on that? Uh, Evelina, but then it would be problematic for the private sector. Not everyone understands the urgent issue of collaboration. You're right, absolutely. This is a dilemma because for a private innovator, they want to make money and they probably, if, if every innovation that had environmental value was widely shared, then certainly the private sector would find it very challenging or not very appealing to innovate. So it's exactly up to governments to figure out how to do this. Maybe governments should do more of the R&D themselves, or maybe there should be international funds available to compensate and to, to buy those technologies from private innovators. There are many kinds of policy tools we can think of for public and global institutions to incentivize private innovation, even for example, in the medical world, this idea has been floating around a lot. Um, I think Michael Kramer, Nobel laureate, first floated it in the, in the case of medicine, that international organizations or governments can issue like, a, it's called, um, um, a guaranteed purchase uh, scheme, I, I forget the exact name. Basically, the idea is, as a government, or maybe the United Nations, can issue you know, a, a challenge and say, whoever can produce a drug for malaria that will prove effective and will not cost more than X cents per pill, we guarantee that we will buy a billion of these pills. So that is a mechanism which can incentivize private innovation to produce the solution, even though it's known that it's gonna be shared everywhere because the United Nation as a global institution is coming, we are going to buy this from you. A billion pills that you produce that satisfy the, our, those requirements. If it's effective against malaria and it's cheap enough, we guarantee, we commit to pre, pre-commit to buying it from you. And then we will distribute it to everybody for free. It doesn't have to be the, inno the innovator can still make money. So that's an example of one type of global management tool that the international community can have in order to incentivize innovation for public good, like for the climate, food, or water. Okay, so those are some of the big ideas, like all of them require a lot of thinking about how to do them. Um, in the remaining few minutes, I want to share with you just a sketch of the history of this idea, especially the history of the food challenge. So the challenge of producing enough food in the world is a very uh, old challenge, and it involves the, the attempt to really provide everybody in the world with a adequate nutritional security, food security, a good, a good consumption of food. And in the 20th century, the focus of that was about calories. In the 20th century, many people around the world were suffering from hunger. There was just not enough, many people didn't have access to, to, to basic things like calories and suffering from hunger. So the emphasis in the 20th century was how do we grow more calories around the world in order to feed the global population, which was really quickly growing? So that was about reducing hunger and reducing poverty, both for the farmers and for uh, the poor who were consumers of food. That's a 20th century challenge. The 21st century has a different challenge. We now have more calories available per person. There was a great success in the 20th century, but now the challenge is diversification. Calories is important, but it's not enough. We need diverse diets for food security. Protein, fats, uh, micronutrients. We don't produce enough of these, and many people in the world, even though they have enough calories, still don't have enough of these other elements of a good diet. Also, we've become more ambitious. We feel that we can not only reduce hunger and poverty, but we can build on the progress of the 20th century to end, completely end hunger and extreme poverty 
by 2030, in 10 years. Those are the SDGs, of course. So that's a very ambitious goal, and let's hope that we meet this goal. But the big difference in the, in the World Food Challenge in the 21st century and the 20th century is the environmental aspect. There are two sides to this. Um, one side is to make agriculture more resilient to climate change. One of the biggest threats for agriculture now is climate change is already hurting global agriculture. And as climate change gets worse, the concern is it will really reduce the yield and the production severely. So we have to figure out how to make um, global food production resilient to climate change. And the other side of that, we have to reduce food's environmental impact, meaning, um, as we just saw, agriculture is a huge environmental burden globally. And we really need to find ways of growing all this food in a very different way, with less water, less energy, less fertilizer, less pesticide, less pollution. And Evelina, I, I very much agree with you also that we also have in the 21st century have to reduce the impact on animals, not only from an environmental perspective, but also from a humane perspective. Um, now, I don't know whether that will become a 21st century challenge or whether it will wait for the 22nd century. I unfortunately don't think it's at the forefront of the agenda right now to reduce animal suffering, but I hope that it will become so soon in our century and maybe in the next 10 years as to become one of the main, um, main agendas. And food waste is also obviously important. Um, it's really, in a way, we can think about that also if we think about how to produce more food with less environmental impact. In a way, we can think about reducing food waste as part of that, right? Because we will be, need to produce less if we waste less. And that will automatically reduce um, or let's put it under the heading of making, the, making agriculture and the whole value chain more efficient. Efficient in production and efficient in consumption, which would relate to food waste. Absolutely. So those are the challenges of the 21st century. Okay. Um, how did the 20th century, how did humanity succeed in meeting this challenge in the 20th century? It mostly happened through the Green Revolution. Does anybody know what the Green Revolution is? Has anybody heard of the Green Revolution? Any idea? You can also guess. The hint is in the picture. Any guess of what this picture is of? It actually says it. I haven't heard any of you speak for like 20 minutes already. I'm dying to hear a human voice. Um, maybe a green revolution in the sense of um, efficiently growing a lot of crops that can feed a lot of people at once. So that's partly true. Any other ideas? Somebody is saying GMOs, technology transfer, fuel with biosources, but I'm looking for something very specific. So, Indian reform, to give sorry? The Indian reform. Indian reform? Yeah, to start. Um, which reform exactly? Yeah, the one that um, concerned uh, eating all Indian food and increasing the production. I don't remember the name of it. Yeah, so that was definitely, India was one of the main countries, but this was a global thing. So the Green Revolution is actually a name given, umbrella name given for the research and development of new types of seed varieties, rice, wheat, corn, maize, those are the main um, sources of calories in the world, the main cereals in the world. And the Green Revolution was basically scientists around the world developing better varieties of these crops to replace the traditional varieties. 
And the good thing about those varieties was that they produce more grain. So that means more food, more calorie. Now there are a few important things to know about this. First of all, this research was public research, not private. So we go back to the idea we just discussed about, and it was done through an international organization of agricultural research and development. It's called CGIAR. It's a network that still exists today of, of organizations which do research all the time to develop better and better varieties of the crops that we eat. So it's a beautiful example of a very successful international R&D um, activity funded by many countries that led to a technological revolution of farming everywhere in the world, especially in low-income countries like India at the time. And this is a picture of an Indian farmer who is harvesting uh, some of the rice that he grew with the new variety, the name of the variety is IR8. So this is from where it was planted. <coughs> and those new varieties spread quickly through China, through India, many places in Latin America, Asia, less in, in, less in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. But on a global level, they are responsible for the huge increases in food production that we have around the world. Look at this graph, how much more food was produced around the world. In 1960, less than 1 billion ton. And by today, it's almost three times, it's around three times as much food. Without a lot of land expansion, it's because on the same land, so much more productive. So this was a huge technological revolution. And it was achieved through public research and development which is a beautiful example of the power of international research and development to reach global impact. It was not based on GMOs. It does not use genetic engineering. It's using traditional ways of, of breeding crops. Genetic engineering is when you use genes from two different organisms, two different species. Like, you know, if I use genes from uh, uh, some insect and put them into a, a, a plant. That's genetic engineering. There is no genetic engineering in, this, in the Green Revolution. It was based on traditional ver um, breeding of, of, uh, of these crops. So that is called the Green Revolution. Like grafting, but grafting is usually more for trees, I think, and this is done for, for cereal crops. So this is an example of a, of a beautiful success. Um, it was achieved through the 20th century challenge was achieved through public research to breed high yielding varieties of staple cereals. And this was accompanied by the subsidization of water and fertilizer. Because what the Green Revolution produced is the varieties of crops that give you a lot of grain if you give them more water and more fertilizer. So this is a technological revolution that also meant you have to use more water, more fertilizer, more energy, more pesticide. And therefore, the big problem with the Green Revolution is that it created um, a very, very severe environmental impacts like we saw. Pollution of water, overuse of water, climate change, um, pollution of soils, etc., etc. And that's why for the 21st century, the challenge is different. The challenge is about, as we just saw, the challenge was um, to make agriculture not produce more food, but produce the same amount of food with less environmental impact with less water, less fertilizer, less pesticide, less greenhouse gas emissions. So now we need to make agriculture much more precise, much more efficient, and also more resilient, more, less vulnerable to changing uh, uh, climate. But why can't we use the same tools? Should the world community now not use um, the same approach of an international program of research and development 
to develop agricultural technologies, including seeds, that require less water, require less fertilizer, require less greenhouse gas emissions. It can, it can be livestock, it can be crops, it can be anything. We, have, we need a technological revolution. We need a second green revolution. Some people call it the evergreen revolution, which will be about not growing more, but growing the same with less environmental impact. And unfortunately, the investments in the international public R&D in agriculture has been going down. Much of the investment in agricultural R&D now comes through private research, which is great, except that we need to be concerned that commercial private research may not target technologies that improve the environment. It may still target technologies which are only about producing more because Commercial innovation will target private interest and not public interest unless the international community steps in to create those incentives. And that's a great example of global governments which we need in the world of food. And then the second part of it is that... You, you have a question from Cornelius, I think. Cornelius, please. Sorry, I don't see the hand. Sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. Sorry for interrupting. Um, I just no, thought uh, I have a question concerning the research and development because um, we've had a few guests now in the last weeks that, um, or in the, also in the last semester that mentioned a very similar problem that also in their field, if it, now it wasn't climate change, oops, sorry, um, they also mentioned the same problem that um, research and development investment is going down in general. And this is a huge problem, as we're now seeing also, that governments are not willing to spend um, that much of their budget on, on research and development, which is very likely to solve a lot of problems. So um, my question is, what do you see as the reason why do, they, um, why do they reduce the investments? I mean, I think from the US under the Trump administrations, it was very visible who, um, because under the Trump administration, they cut a lot of these fundings. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, you know, why politicians make wrong decisions, uh, it, it's a big question. Um, I think there are probably many reasons. I don't know the answer. I think maybe short-sightedness is one example of that. Um, but I agree that we need more public R&D and especially for environmentally beneficial technologies. And that's exactly the point uh, I want to reach that we often talk about global regulation, global agreements, incentives like a carbon price, a carbon tax, and all that. I think those are very important, but the point I'm trying to make is that we should not forget about the importance of R&D to create um, internationally available technologies and innovations for solving these environmental problems. In this case, in the case of food, creating means to produce food which require less, you know, which have low environmental impact. So I, I can't really answer your question about why it's not happening other than hypothesizing that it's basically the short-sightedness of politicians. But I want to highlight what I think is very important to push in parallel to our attempts to reach a regulatory framework or international incentives for carbon emissions, for agricultural markets, etc. The R&D piece, I think, is also very important. And usually, it turns out R&D is a more cost-effective way of solving these problems. For example, if tomorrow somebody can invent um, a solar panel, which is very, very cheap, and you know, that is going to do a lot of the work we need to get it to be adopted all over the world, even without the regulation. So I'm not saying that regulation and incentives are not needed, but a combination is important. And that's also why the last point I wanted to make in the case of food is that um, in the 20th century, most government made it easier for their farmers to acquire the inputs, the water, the energy, and the fertilizers. In the 21st century, the challenge is, in parallel with the technological innovation, to make it to disincentivize farmers from using those inputs. And that's a very difficult challenge because many countries around the world, especially developing countries, 
for which have a very large amounts of their labor population engaged in farming, they want to protect their incomes, and it's not clear how to continue economic development in those countries, especially for these smallholder farmers, while also um, disincentivizing them or incentivizing them to use water and electricity and fertilizers, use less of it, use it more efficiently. That is a challenge that like the Indian government, the Chinese government are very str much struggling with. How to balance better environmental precision, but without uh, hurting, without putting the burden on the smallholder farmers, of which there are still hundreds of millions of people, without hurting their livelihood, because already they are, very, they are the most low income population in the world. So how to balance um, environmental precision with protecting the livelihoods of these people is one of the main challenges for sustainable development in this century. And I'll end here and just mention that what we do, what I do and our students do in our lab is to try to find solutions like that, which involves technologies and some in interesting business model to implement them in the field conditions in India and in Africa to try to see whether there are any solutions which can achieve both together, improve the environment and improve the income of these farmers. Um, that is essential way like like what, what we did in 1960s with this farmer, we should do now with similar farmers in Africa, in Asia, but at the same time while also achieving um, reduced environmental impact. That's very hard. That's what we do in the field as part of our research. And uh, I'll just say in one word, Professor Piga, we have just opened a new master program that is dedicated to this kind of work. So if any of you are interested, um, we can share the information with you. I hear some of you may be looking after you graduate for an interesting master's program. We would love to uh, get some applications from you guys. Um, that's very much related to field work and innovation and entrepreneurship for sustainable development. Um, but it's very much related to the big ideas that we discussed now. And let me finish here because I'm already over time. Well, if there was to be a if there was to be a speech for uh, pushing forward a program like global governance, I think that many many professors of the program found themselves useful because of the things you said and the amount of uh, interdisciplinary knowledge that is involved in a global governance process of this kind. Uh, that was really really interesting. Laura, you had a question. Go ahead. We have time. How much time do we have, uh, Ram? uh when I, do you have to run away i think i have i have uh 10 15 minutes okay so laura go ahead no because it was actually a tough, a tough question Sorry, so i, I, I uh, was something i always tell my students never start a question with a no okay <laughs> go ahead laura <laughs> okay so uh hi um, I'm reading this book for, for my thesis, which is exactly talking about this fact that um, especially the private sector has difficulties in spreading innovative and uh, clean uh, technologies. And the fact is that uh, is, uh, the, the market system that is um, uh, creating this, these difficulties because uh, um, this book talks about the fact that this clean tech uh, entrepreneurship uh, has to first demonstrate some uh, inter incremental gains so gains so it has to be um, convenient for the people before to demonstrate uh, that it saves the planet in some sense and I find uh, that this is a contradiction and um, I wanted to know what do you think about that, if this could be one of the main problems that is um, putting some obstacles to the um, research development and um, to the spreading of this technology. Thank you. If you, don't, if you don't mind, we'll take two more and you can answer the three of them. Sure. Tommaso. 
Hi, I'm Tommaso Celani from the third year and recently I read an article. We discussed about the fact that we need to make agriculture more uh, resilient to climate change. Well, I recently read an article about uh, China's approach, which is basically changing the climate in order to uh, keep on with the agricultural production. In fact, it's going to use cloud dissemination to have uh, controllable rains in its western regions. Um, I wanted to know, to kind of avoid these approaches, because I think that those ultimately in the long run will disrupt the climate equilibrium, uh, what do you think that we should do? Should we like cre try to create international cooperation, which is actually capable of entering the territory of this nation and banning such techniques, or should we push for research and development in order to create uh, uh, crops or seeds that have such an economic rent that the countries are naturally going to shift to use them? And uh, finally, Maria Arcangela. Hello, Maria Arcangela. From the... Maria Arcangela, stronger voice, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I'm You're Maria far Arcangela. away. Is it better? Not for me, I don't know for Ram, but uh, really far away. Do you hear me now? Yeah, better. Oh, okay, perfect, sorry. So I'm Maria Arcangela from third year, and I just wanted to know your considerations on the common agricultural policy of the EU. Okay, wow. Luckily, I, I can escape by saying I have to, I'm out of time because those are three really hard questions. So I'm just gonna share a few thoughts. I don't have good answers to any of these questions. Um, I think, Laura, the, what you raised is an excellent point. Um, I don't think it would be realistic study in the world, um, certainly not a smallholder farmer, to adopt a technology because of its environmental benefits. Um, it's not that people are bad, but everybody faces a lot of stress and, you know, in the same way that most of us, you know, we are all concerned with the environment, but what we do about it in practical terms is negligible. That's, so it has to happen. I think the, the, the way it needs to happen is we need to develop technologies that first and foremost provide a benefit for the user and along the way also provide an environmental benefit. I'll give you an example, very famous Israeli example, drip irrigation. It's a way of irrigating the crop that brings the water exactly to the root because there is a hole in the pipe right near the root. This increases the yields, but it also saves water if it's used properly. So those is, this is like a win-win technology. It's good for the user, it's good for the environment. Now, we may not be able to find this kind of thing for everything, probably. And this is also where we need to create the incentives. This is where a country, a government can create the incentive if so, so that somebody can gain money by saving water or using less fertilizer. And actually how to do that is a very interesting challenge. If I have an Indian farmer and we have worked on this in the ground, how do I create incentives for Indian farmers to save on the water they use, on the electricity they use? How to design that from a political mechanism perspective so that it works, so that it leads to the effect and it's, you know, it's good for society. There are many logistical issues and political issues that come up once you start trying to implement those things. And here is where we need innovation. Innovation is not only technological. Innovation can also be political, can be institutional. So we really need to sit down and think about good ideas on how to create the combination of the technology and the incentive that will make those who benefit the environment gain money, gain in terms of, I very much believe that. Um, Tommaso, as regard to your question, it's a little bit related. I also am uncomfortable with uh, climate engineering, um, but I worry that the longer the world fails in reaching coordinated political action on mitigating, preventing climate change, the more likely it will become that some countries are going to just go for geoengineering to stop climate change. Um, you know, mitigation requires coordination by everybody, but just actively playing with the climate, any country can do on its own. And I don't think it's unlikely that 
to see China eventually going for something like this in a very aggressive way. And even though from a scientific point of view, I, it, it might have some chance of succeeding, I think I do and perhaps you and many others, we feel uncomfortable with that approach of dealing with our environmental to change it. So I very much hope and prefer that we don't go there, that to prevent this temptation to go in that direction, we really um, invest a lot in international R&D to make it available for Chinese farmers to be able to deal with this problem to such measures. Hopefully, um, I very much hope that that is the direction we take. And finally, um, with regard to the EU uh, farm policy, please forgive me. I don't want to speak about something that I am not an expert on. Um, so I will just uh, request you to allow me to pass on this question. If you ask me about India or Africa, I know more. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that I don't know enough beyond in the newspaper. I don't know enough about the EU policy. So I think it's better for you to talk to somebody who is an expert on that than to hear my own random thoughts, which are not founded on any real uh, expertise. So I hope you allow me to pass on this question. Sorry. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fishman. I, while I ask you not to leave immediately because I wanted to tell you one thing at the end of the meeting, I would like on behalf of all the GG1, GG2, GG3 students that were here today to thank you profusely. I said it before, this is a, a lecture that for us puts things very much in perspective for what we are doing, how important it is that the knowledge that we teach in an interdisciplinary program makes sense for what is out there and needs a solution. And then obviously, as you said, as you mentioned with your master, once we find our way, we specialize, but uh, from carrying with us an interdisciplinary perspective like you did in your life, starting from mathematics, going to the physics, uh, then going to the career in fantastic institutions. So uh, they can put the microphone on. It's always very nice that they say goodbye, not just writing on the chat like they're doing now. And uh, we thank you very much. And we hope to see you in Rome very soon. Also, maybe online to present more specifically the master itself. And maybe I want to come physically to Rome to do that. I know. Uh, we, have, we have an undue advantage. That's for okay. sure. That's for sure. Microphones on. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank, you, thank you very Thank much. you very thank much. You. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Ciao. Uh, Ram, I wanted the, the, to make sure that you uh, came to know our um, Professor Julia Costa. She is an environmental engineer. She works on water uh, specifically. She has a fantastic course in global governance on environment. And uh, the group at Tor Vergata that does uh, issues on uh, water management in engineering is very, very strong internationally. So I wanted the two of you to meet. She has been here. Julia, are you here? Yes, hello. Sorry, I just joined you at the end. I must confess. Okay. <laughs> Great to meet you. Great Ram. to meet you too. My I close wanted... colleague, I am also working closely with the, the environmental engine, the head of the environmental engineering program at Tel Aviv University. And I, we are working together very closely in, on, in the field. So uh, I have experience and I enjoy arguing with the engineer in a very affectionate way. So uh, um, this is somebody also maybe that you should connect to. Um, and maybe if we find ways to do some things together between the institutions, we should really um, follow up. What, what, I was, what I was thinking of doing was to send an email today or tomorrow to the three of us and then maybe Julia can tell you a little bit more and you can put her in touch with the TAV people and maybe something starts. We have done, uh, Julia has done fantastic work with her colleagues on uh, Tsinghua uh, in China where they have a strong oh. environmental engineering uh, yeah. department. So it would be very nice if uh, I mean, we have an agreement with TAV that is mostly related to student exchange, but it's also about cooperation. So anything that comes out in terms of additional